can I can start with the with the basic things. Um, so welcome everyone, um, and thank you for joining us uh, for this month uh, CSFS Associate Seminar. Uh, my name is Laura Morillas, and I am the research manager at the Center for Sustainable Food Systems at UBC Farm. Um, and first of all, and considering the times that we are all living, I would like to definitely begin by, by acknowledging uh, that UBC, uh, UBC Vancouver Point Grey Campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, uh, and unceded territory of the Muscan people. I would also like to recognize that you are joining us today from many places. Uh, some of you might be near, some of you might be far. And also uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of and caretakers of those lands. Um, we will always we always start uh, encouraging people to know more about uh, the the whose territories do you uh, recent currently reside, uh, and also to think and reflect about how are you accountable um, to the people of those lands. Um, so if you really don't know, because that might be the case, uh, you don't know uh, whose territories you are on, we would like to encourage you to begin that learning uh, uni um, by doing some research. Um, we are here today to talk about research, so why we are not going to do research on that. So one way where you could do that, uh, it's using uh, the native land.ca link uh, that Jacqueline very nicely is, ju is just throwing to the chat. Um, and you can uh, learn more about uh, what are the, the First Nations or indigenous people that lives uh, and, and who took care of those lands for a very long time. And before we keep going, I will also like, uh, and I would like to take a moment, really, um, we will take like a half a minute or one minute to uh, honor and remember the 215 children whose remains were recently found at the grounds uh, of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. Um, UBC grieves with the families and the communities, uh, residential school survivors and all who mourn uh, right now for this huge loss. And please join me uh, in a moment of silence uh, to honor those children. Okay. Well, uh, if you if you don't have a lot of information, or if you want to learn a little bit more uh, about the Indian Residential School's history and the Dialogue Center, you can you can look for more information in the link that uh, again um, Jacqueline just throw into the into the uh, chat. Um, and yeah, and after that kind of like difficult uh, moment, um, well, we would like to again um, welcome you to the seminar. Um, this CSFS seminar, uh, Associate Seminar Series is brought to you by the Center for Sustainable Food Systems. Um, and basically the center uh, is a teaching and research center as well as a local to global hub, food hub working towards a more sustainable food and um, food secure uh, future. Our mission is to innovate uh, from field to fork to achieve resilient, thriving and socially just food systems for all of us. Um, and today's seminar's topic, um, it's uh, the, the title of the, of the seminar is Regulated Deficit Irrigation Strategies for Saving Irrigation Water in, in Vineyards. And we have Dr. Simon Castellarin, I should say Castellarin in Italian properly. <laughs> um, and he will discuss uh, with all of us uh, how the development of deficit irrigation strategies might result in improved wine quality and more sustainable wine productions in British Columbia and worldwide. Um, before Simon starts talking, I would like to just add a little bit of housekeeping details. 
um, make sure that you can throw your questions uh, in the in, in the chat in this case because uh, this is a, a meeting and not a seminar. Um, so feel free to add your questions in the chat and at the end of the presentation, um, I will try to summarize them uh, for Simon. Or I might ask you to actually, um, uh, you know, like turn on your microphones and ask the questions directly to Simon. We are planning to have like a 15 minutes Q&A session at the very end of the presentation. Um, so yeah, we you will have opportunities to, to discuss with Simon. And now just introduce Simon. That's my last piece of job. <laughs> um, so it's my very pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Simone Castellarin. Um, uh, and Simon investigates the ripening process in grapes and blueberries and the biological mechanisms uh, that determine uh, grapes and blueberry quality. Uh, moreover, he studies how berry quality is affected by env environmental factors like temperature and water. Um, and Dr. Castellarin uh, is developing agronomical strategies like irrigation, crop management, hormone applications to improve ripening and the accumulation of pigments and aromas in grapes and blueberries. So, Simon, the floor is completely yours. I cannot wait. This, this, this presentation really touched my, my research background. So, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura. And thank you very much to the Center for Sustainable Food Systems for this invitation as well. I would like to thank all of you for attending this seminar. So, I'm going to share my screen here uh, in one second. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're seeing. Yes, Simon, we are my presentation here. in full screen Insights. now, correct? Right? Okay. So again, uh, thank you. And today I would like to talk uh, about one of uh, the research topic we have been exploring for many years in our laboratory, that is how we can manage irrigation in vineyards with the goal of saving water, but also of improving the quality of the grapes and the wine that we produce from those vineyards. This is definitely a, a topic that uh, is important for uh, viticulture and wine production worldwide. Uh, I'm using this figure from Hannah et al. 2013, uh, a study that um, focused on understanding how climate will affect the wine production um, worldwide. And um, I'm using this figure to show you here in uh, uh, red. I'll, let me just uh, uh, make a pointer, laser pointer. So those uh, red uh, areas that you can see in the northern and southern hemisphere are the regions where we are currently producing grapes. Uh, those are uh, regions that have mostly Mediterranean climates, warm and dry, with warm and dry summers, where actually grapes express, well, uh, the best quality uh, for, particularly for the wine production. However, this study is also affecting how future climates will affect the productions of grape and wine worldwide. And uh, interestingly, they, well, the model that in, the, in, in 2050, we could expect expansion of production or actually uh, regions that are now uh, not uh, well suitable for grape production will become suitable due to climate change and normally are northern latitudes of Europe as well as northern latitudes of the Pacific coast of North America. So that's actually quite interesting because one of the for, uh, one of the regions that are expected to expand are well the wine regions of British Columbia, and this is something that is already occurring. Um, we the grape and wine production in British Columbia have been growing exponentially in the past twenty years, and they are still expanding. So with climate change, uh, there is actually the expectation those wine regions of having. Um, more frequent droughts, even in regions where now we do not irrigate, irrigation might be needed in the future. Um, and, uh, and so there is a growing interest in understanding the, how to manage water inputs in vineyards. And uh, grapes are uh, a 
a crop that uh, is quite quite well adapted to dry uh, dry regions. And here is uh, what I think is a beautiful vineyard in Lanzarote, Spain, in the Canary Islands, a vineyard that well is grown without irrigation with very limited precipitation, 120, 150 millimeters of rain per year. And you can see how, well, what is the beautiful result, in my opinion, like with these very nice uh, small vines. And these very nice small vines actually have a production. It's one or two plus per vine. And it's a niche production in, in, in that region where they make wine out of this uh, vineyard and out of this vine. However, this production in the majority of the cases are not sustainable. Uh, we need higher yields to make an economic profit out of a vineyard. And uh, the water limitation, you know, uh, will uh, or actually affects those uh, yields. And therefore, we do need normally more water to uh, sustainably produce grapes. And here is an example of a region that has a similar amount of water per year. It's Kelowna, British Columbia, so the Okanagan Valley. Here is 100, 130 millimeters of rain during the growing season of the vine. But in this case, we have, uh, well, in this case is the Okanagan Lake, where we can um, take irrigation water and irrigate those vines. And you see, as a result, larger canopies, as well as higher yields. So many clusters provide, and these, uh, well, the availability of water makes those productions sustainable, economically sustainable. So irrigation science, uh, is actually a major field in viticulture. And despite that we have been studying for about 80 years the effect of irrigation on uh, grape and wine productions and quality, uh, there has been an exponential increase in the number of studies that focus on these topics. And, uh, and, and you can see, in fact, you know, from the 90s and 80s, then we, we have observed this exponential growth of uh, the number of studies. And here is actually, uh, I'm reporting some of the reason why uh, uh, we are well increasingly um, studying um, this uh, topic. But first of all, what I mentioned before, there is uh, the climate change is occurring and, and, uh, and has determined that we have more drought events in uh, wine regions and regions that were traditionally not used to irrigate, now they have to irrigate. Therefore, it's important to understand how to manage this irrigation uh, to, to, you know, in uh, vineyards with varieties that before uh, were not, uh, well, um, requiring uh, irrigation water as well as they were never exposed to, to drought events. Uh, also, uh, there is a strong effect of irrigation, of the lack of irrigation, or let's say of water deficit on the quality of grapes and wine. And this is actually a major uh, point uh, that I will uh, discuss across the whole seminar. Um, when we apply water or when the plant experiences water uh, stress, um, the response by changing the metabolism of the fruit and some of these metabolites are really important for the grape and wine quality. So uh, the amount of water we apply will actually affect uh, the quality of the wine. That is a key uh, is of key importance for the uh, profitability of a vineyard. And then uh, we water is a limited resources, and there is growing attention on how we can limit the water inputs in agriculture in general, but in this case in, in viticulture in particular. So um, developing strategies that um, allow to save water in vineyards and well uh, sustainably sustainably grow uh, grow grapes and produce wines is actually a focus of the uh, wine and grape um, industry in British Columbia, as, uh, as well as, uh, you know, the international industry. So I'll start by giving a bit of an introduction of what happens when the plant is actually experience, experiencing a lack of water or what we call water deficit. So it starts experiences that the water available is not actually sufficient to 
perform um, you know some of the physiological activity to uh, at optimal levels so when we have um, you know water deficit when we have a plant experience water deficit uh, well we we observed that the plant the vine in this case uh, reduces uh, what we call the leaf gas exchanges basically here you have a, a picture of uh, uh, the stomata on a, on a leaf of a well irrigated vine, and you see that it's open, and so in, there are maximized um, uh, gas exchanges. And, uh, and here you have uh, the stomata of a leaf of a vine that is actually uh, under stress, and you see that the stomata here is closed. And it, the stomata gets closed because the, uh, the plan was to save the water, the few water available from the soil. But in parallel with this uh, um, um, reduced transpiration, so uh, re re um, reduced water usage, we also have a reduction in photosynthesis. So reduction of the carbons that are fixed and the sugars that are produced by the plant. So as a result, actually, we have that uh, reduction of the canopy growth and the vineyard that I've been showing uh, before was an example, like the vineyard from Lanzarote, Spain, you know, very small canopy, as well as a reduction of the yield of the plant. Um, an important factor is that there is reduction of yield is related to reduction in the berry size, so that the fruit is smaller normally if the plant grows under water deficit. And this is a very important aspect that also relates to the quality and we'll discuss later on, as well as uh, there is a direct effect of the stress um, on the compounds, chemical compounds that are produced in the fruit. And uh, so these chemical compounds can be very important for the wine quality and therefore water deficit is actually affecting wine quality. However, this effect normally changes depending on the variety we are considering. And that's why uh, we have so many studies around the world on the effect of water depth or irrigation on, uh, on grape and wine production, because we have uh, thousands of varieties that are produced around the world. And, and so uh, scientists and growers from different regions are studying you know, the effect of this deficit or irrigation on their own varieties. Uh, the environment where we grow the plants also interacts with the uh, water availability of the soil. Therefore, uh, the um, water deficit or the irrigation applied in a given uh, climate and environment might result in different effects on the yield and the quality than the same treatments, let's say, or the same condition in another environment. The timing when we apply water deficit or, or is or when water deficit occurs actually um, is also important. We can have different results if the plant experiences water deficit early in the season when the fruit is small and green or late in the season when the fruit is uh, well uh, ripening and is reaching sugars and, uh, and um, is close to harvest. And also, uh, it's very critical, the severity of the deficit. So for how long the plant is experiencing uh, water deficit, but particularly to what level of deficit. The deficit can be mild and moderate, but can be very severe. And so that's also uh, critical, critical to understand, to understand how the plant and the production will respond to these situ uh, deficit scenarios. Another uh, um, thing, I think I would like to introduce that is very important when we st study irrigation management in vineyard is actually something that relates to the biology and the metabolism of the fruit and the grapefruit in particular here. Um, compounds that are chemical compounds, metabolites, that are of key importance for the quality of the wines are mostly synthesized in these thin layers of cells that we call skin. So the peripheral part of the berry is the part that is actually in charge of producing most of the quality compounds that will affect the wine. Uh, the, these uh, well, cells, the flesh here, obviously are many and large, and they um, accumulate a lot of sugar and organic acids that are also important for the quality. But if uh, uh, we consider 
the, 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 those compounds that really affect the quality of wine, like the aromas and the phenolics that affect the color and the uh, taste of the wine, those are mostly accumulated in the skin. And this, this has important implication uh, when we talk about water management in vineyard. In fact, um, it's actually uh, common to believe uh, among winemakers that small berries in general have higher quality than big berries or will give wine of a higher quality than big berries. And this is because they, you know, they know that when we increase the size of the berry, for instance, by applying water, by irrigating the vineyard, as an effect, we have bigger berries. Well, what happens is that the proportionally the um, surface of the berry grows or increases in uh, you know, re relatively less than the volume uh, of the berry. Therefore, those compounds that are producing in, in the surface they get diluted by uh, by the growth of the of uh, of the berry. So that's why um, irrigation it is it is important in vineyard, but at the same time uh, might actually penalize the quality. So when we talk about irrigation, it's important to define uh, to precisely well uh, define what we mean for irrigation and also define what levels of irrigation we are applied in the vineyard because by over irrigating, we can actually impair the quality of uh, the wines we produce from our vineyard. So I don't wanna go too technical here in my seminar, but I just wanna uh, introduce this concept because uh, you will see probably some of these numbers in figures and tables. Um, uh, again, it, it is important when we talk about deficit and about irrigation to define uh, for instance, what are the deficit level that the plants are experiencing? Uh, is the deficit severe, moderate, and mild? And it's also important in, uh, well, finding ways to determine precisely these levels. So we, we often, in the majority of cases, we use this tool um, as, as scientists and researchers, but also as growers, particularly in the Okanagan Valley and other dry areas like California, Australia, et cetera, we use this tool we call Scholander Pressure Chamber from Scholander, the scientist that, uh, well, invented this tool, uh, where we basically pressurize uh, leaves to understand uh, the water status of the plant. So more pressure we apply to a leaf to squeeze out a drop of water from that leaf, more uh, uh, the plant is stressed, basically. So it's a tool that allows us to understand how stressed is the plant by analyzing a leaf. Uh, we call this, uh, well, um, measurement, leaf water potential measurement or stem water potential. I'm not going to the detail what is a stem and leaf water potential. In both cases, we analyze a leaf. Uh, and we put a, basically a leaf inside this chamber here where the leaf gets pressurized and we observe, you know, what is the pressure, the amount of pressure we have to put to uh, obtain a, some water or to get some water out of the leaves. Uh, this uh, amount of pressure is proportional, well, to the uh, level of stress. It's actually a negative value. So lower is the value, higher is the stress that the plant is experienced and higher is the value lowers the, spread, plant, uh, the stress that the plant is experiencing. And here, um, I'm just mentioning, uh, you know, some, some levels, some numbers. I, I don't actually want to go into details, but basically by me using this tool and measuring uh, the leaf water potential, we can understand when a vine has no stress or when a vine has severe stress or when, uh, when a vine has moderate or mild uh, stress levels. Um, we, we, we kind of know quite well how these numbers of plant water status result into, you know, uh, yield uh, values, meaning that we know that if the plant is not experiencing any stress, we'll have a high yield, obviously depending on how we prune the vines, etc. But generally when the stress gets severe, we have strong reductions of yield. What we know a bit less is, the, is how these severe or intermediate stress levels result in uh, better or worse uh, 
um, quality, fruit quality and wine quality level. So this is what we are doing in our laboratory as well as many other people is doing around the world, trying to understand uh, what are the optimal thresholds of stress that might actually limit the reduction of yield that occurs when the plant is stressed, but at the same time promote the quality of the grapes and the wine. Here is, for instance, a meta-analysis we did last year uh, on the effects of moderate and severe water deficit on, um, well, on the quality and yield parameters of red grapes and red wines. So we, we observe that both moderate and severe water stress levels are increasing the concentration of anthocyanins that are the pigments of the red grapes, increasing the concentration of the tannins that affect the taste and, uh, uh, and, and in general, the quality of the grapes and the wine. So we do observe increases in concentration, also 50%. Higher increases under uh, severe water deficit conditions, and we do observe also increases not only on, on the berries, but obviously also on the wine that result from those berries. However, as you can see from this side, is you know severe water stress might reduce the yield uh, of a vineyard by seventy percent. So those are uh, very severe, uh, well, um, well, big reduction in yield that, is, that often will make the production not sustainable. Um, this is why in most cases, people focus on um, developing moderate uh, strategies of irrigation that, that um, determine moderate water deficit in vineyards so that we can have some benefits in terms of the composition of the fruit but at the same time, we have just limited a loss in productions. This is uh, something we know, we know and we are doing, applying modern water deaths in vineyards, in our vineyards, in our commercial vineyards of, of, of many um, you know, warm and dry regions around the world, particularly for red grape varieties. And the reason is because red grape varieties are strongly affected by these compounds, anthocyanins, the pigments and tannins, the bitter astringent compounds that give, uh, um, um, well, uh, the body, determine the body and the taste of the wine. We know less about how stress and moderate stress applied to vines affect uh, the quality of white grapes. Uh, the reason being that white grapes are mostly, white grapes and white wines are mostly produced in, uh, mm, well, cooler regions around the world rather than warmer regions. And, uh, and often they, well, traditionally they've been exposed to less, um, to, uh, less um, drought periods. So they uh, often we produce white grapes in regions where irrigation is not needed. However, nowadays, well, uh, the, the need for irrigation, those vineyards is increasing. So we do need to understand how to manage irrigation to sustain the yield, but also promote the quality of these vines. And we started with this study about uh, 10 years ago and um, here you see the canopy of a vine uh, that is well irrigated versus the canopy of a vine that is going under severe water stress. And well, this is definitely not a healthy canopy. A lot of um, leaves are um, well falling. Um, well, this picture has been taken at harvest. So uh, before during the season, the canopy was definitely better. However, definitely there is a strong impact on the canopy. But I'm saving you most of the results we obtained from this study, but I, I'm going to focus on the most interesting result. And was that when a plant, so C was a well irrigated vine that had no stress, and D is the deficit irrigated vine, meaning that we irrigated the vine only if the stress was becoming severe or very severe. Otherwise, these plants were receiving no irrigation. Um, so what we observe is that um, some compounds, they are called terpenes and they are very important aromas for several uh, wine grape varieties. 
were actually increased in the biosynthesis and the concentration in the fruit that was expe uh, exposed to severe, moderate severe water stress. This, uh, this was quite novel. We, we didn't know that. And, um, and it was quite interesting because those compounds are really important for the quality of several wine grape varieties, including, for instance, Riesling, Gewurztraminer, if you are familiar with wine, or Muscat, et cetera. So this study actually was uh, done in a variety that is common in northeast of Italy, but it's also produced in Chile, it's called Sauvignon Vert, and it's originally from France, it's called Sauvignonas in France. Uh, Tocai Frulano is the Italian name of the variety. So this study told us that actually there were other aspects rather than the color and, the, and those other phenolics like the tannins I mentioned before that are important for red grapes that could affect the quality of wines, particularly of white wines. Um, in fact, we produce wines out of these uh, uh, trials and we observe, and this is the gray bar here, the gray bars identify the deficit, what we call deficit um, uh, wines. So these wines have been produced from the fruit that were expo uh, was exposed to water deficit. And we observe a consistent increase in the concentration in the wines of several of these compounds we call uh, terpenes that are aromas basically. And, uh, and these were increased both in their free and bound form. Um, so these volatiles, these aromas can be free. So uh, free means that they are volatile. They are not attached to any other molecule. And therefore they, you know, they, they are uh, released from the fruit or also from the wine and we can smell that. But these compounds get also accumulated in larger amount in the grapes uh, in the bound form, meaning attached to a sugar that uh, um, allows them to be stored in the vacuole. So those are not volatiles, but during the fermentation, so when we produce wine out of a grape, the yeast, as well as the acid environment of a fermenting um, wine, uh, promotes the hydrolysis of the sugar from the volatile compound, and therefore these compounds can become uh, uh, volatile and odorous. So in both cases, free and bound, were increased in concentration by, uh, in the wine uh, by applying water deficit in the vineyard. So that was, uh, again, as I say, quite interesting because we thought that managing irrigation or um, let's say, uh, managing water stress in the vineyard could be a tool to improve actually the quality of some of these white grape, or at least that by reducing irrigation, we could improve the quality of grapes. Uh, and again, I say quality because these volatiles are aromas, and if you are interested in knowing the, the, those, uh, those aromas are floral, but also fruity, like citrus-like aromas. Here you have roses, roses uh, lavenders, and citrus. Those are typical uh, aromas that these volatiles give to grapes and wine. So that study was quite, um, well, uh, it was an, exper an experiment. And the, the stress level were severe, uh, or, or rather severe, so that we have loss of production that were around 40, 50 percent. So a reduction of yield of 40 percent is definitely uh, remarkable, particularly for commercial productions. But we thought, okay, maybe we can develop what we call regulated deficit irrigation strategies uh, to manage um, well uh, quality. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in vineyards and, uh, that are producing white grapes, and also to reduce actually water inputs, as I said before. Uh, in fact, um, normally irrigation, and now I'm kind of repeating myself, in vineyards is uh, applied to alleviate severe deficit, but, um, but it's not, I mean, uh, it's not uh, applied to target or to facilitate or to promote the optimum levels of photosynthesis or, of, or yield of the vineyard. The reason being, if we optimize those levels, we might actually end up with a dilution of those um, important quality compounds I've, I, I mentioned before. So 
our goal uh, of, uh, of this study that I'm going to present now in the last part of my seminar is was to look for um, irrigation strategies in vineyards that were uh, maintaining the plant under moderate water deficit levels um, that will allow to save irrigation water, but also to uh, potentially improve the quality of uh, the vines uh, in, in white grapes that are uh, characterized by a high concentration of these terpenes, these uh, floral uh, aromas um, uh, that I was mentioning before. And this study was uh, performed in the Okanagan Valley. The Okanagan Valley is, uh, well, is the main viticultural region, wine region of British Columbia, where 85% of the grapes are produced, is a uh, desert, semi-arid uh, shrubland. So grapes are irrigated actually from early on during the season throughout the whole season. We need irrigation to sustain production, but the question here is how much irrigation we need. Can we reduce irrigation, the standard irrigation we apply uh, to save water and improve quality. The study was done in um, Oliver actually, and, uh, and uh, focusing on this variety called Gewurztraminer. Gewurztraminer is one of those varieties characterized by these um, uh, floral aromas. And uh, as you say, the Okanagan is a perfect region where to perform uh, irrigation studies. Uh, we, we have, well, you can see the rainfall amount. Uh, well, we have kind of uh, like rain during the spring, but then for instance, 2017, it stopped uh, raining uh, in June and we had no, or May, June, and we had no rain until harvest. Harvest is actually this red arrow here. In uh, other seasons, we had you know, rain until July, but then we have a very dry period. So um, we, uh, we need, uh, in generally, when we produce grapes in the Okanagan, we have to irrigate because it's quite dry. And, um, and so our study consider the application of different irrigation treatments. One we call control, and it's basically what the winery was already doing. So it was basically irrigating on a weekly basis or two times per week to maintain the plant, you know, at um, levels, uh, zero level of stress. Basically, the plant was never stressed. There's a water potential that, that is associated to those levels. Uh, but our treatments were actually applying stress, and here is the red bar. And here is the water potential associated to a moderate water stress level um, before the onset of ripening that is here, and then irrigating the plant, or vice versa, irrigating the plant at the beginning of the season and then stressing during the ripening time of the plant, or let's say stressing the plant throughout the whole season. And when I say stressing, I don't mean just not irrigating, I mean irrigating only if the plant was severely stressed. So we have to measure the level of stress and apply water accordingly. We studied how this affected the canopy, the physiology of the plant, the yield, uh, the technological maturity, sugars and acids, but also how this affected the free and bound terpenes, those uh, aromas that affect the wine quality, the wine aroma. I will just uh, summarize this slide that is full of graphs and lines. But uh, first of all, this is the irrigation applied in our study in the three years, 2016, 17, 18. And in black is the control. So how much water we apply through irrigation during the uh, whole season. And you can see those numbers in terms of millimeters of water. Um, but then we have our other treatments, early deficit, late deficit, prolonged deficit, and you see that the water level applied is lower. And I'm summarizing here. Um, so when we, if we give, you know, 100 amount of irrigation to the controls, early deficit had only 70%, so reduction of 30% of irrigation. Late deficit, so application of stress during the ripening time is uh, allow us to save on average across the three years, 38% of water, irrigation water. And prolonged deficit allowed us to save 
50% of the irrigation water. As I said before, and I'm not going to the details, these uh, are the water potential values we were measuring weekly uh, to uh, tune irrigation accordingly. So to make sure that our plants were not getting too much, uh, too much stress or our plants were not receiving too much water depending on how you say. I just wanna mention that often in our community, I think we, we convey misleading information by saying that uh, moderate water stress do not affect photosynthesis. Actually, my opinion is strong because moderate water stress does affect photosynthesis, reduces 50% um, of the photosynthesis. So there is a reduction in photosynthesis uh, and is uh, actually one of the first responses of the plan when it perceives some uh, water, you know, lack of water. So we, our irrigation treatments were affecting photosynthesis and reducing it by 50% on average. However, the question was this reduction in photosynthesis, how much it affects the yield and the quality of the grapes. And this is what I'm gonna show you in the last three slides where we have our you know, data at harvest. This is a picture of our vineyard. Uh, um, and uh, this is actually our prolonged water depths. So the plants that got mo uh, most stressed during the trial. The lack of leaves in this uh, region of the canopy is not due to the stress we applied, but is actually a treatment that growers do in the vineyard to expose the cluster to the sunlight. So you don't see leaves here because they've been removed. It's an agronomical practice. It's not just related to the uh, water deficit. However, the water deficit we did apply, regulated water deficit, affected the canopy. You can see how it's uh, you know, more yellow that probably you can see through the canopy that is very green around that is irrigated, you know, just uh, behind this row. So the effect on yield was a significant for early deficit and prolonged deficit. And it's actually consistent with what we know when we stress a plant early on during the season or for the whole season, we have a reduction, even if the stress is moderate of we have a reduction of yield. But what was interesting for us is that when we were applying regulated deficit irrigation and moderate water deficit during ripening, we had no significant effects on the yield of the vine. And that was important because, uh, well, we were reducing photosynthesis, we were applying 38% less water, but we didn't reduce the yield. And this is an, uh, you know, a two-way ANOVA considering the uh, three, three years of data. In terms of the sugars and tetratable acidity, again, I focus on what it was our best treatment, let's say, uh, on late deficit. That was good because we did not observe significant reduction in sugars. It's actually not a big problem to reduce sugars in the fruit because with climate change, sugar levels are going up. Uh, in many wine regions and alcohol levels in wines are increasing. This is not necessarily something that the industry wants. However, in this case, we had no effect with this late deficit treatment on sugar levels uh, and uh, some significant effect reduction of sugars if the stress was or the moderate stress was um, throughout the season. And uh, I'm. this is... Uh, kind of the key slide, I guess, because our focus was understanding the effect on terpenes and the aromas. And what we observed was consistently with what we observed before in a couple of other studies that by applying these regulated deficit strategies, we could increase the concentration of some key aromas like geranile, that is the major aroma produced by Gewurztraminer, or citronellol, that is an important aroma that smells like roses, that is a typical uh, of, uh, aroma of Gewurztraminer. So by applying late water deficit, meaning stressing the plant during the ripening period of the fruit, we could increase the concentration of these terpenes. Of these two, but we had actually more significantly increased out of 20 total free terpenes uh, that were detected and quantified in the variety. The bound terpenes, the ones that are attached to sugars, actually 
uh, well, had a general in trend and increase, but it was never significant. So we had, let's say, no effects of our treatments of these bound therapies. So that was for us quite a, well, uh, it's quite quite a, an achievement because we we learned several things from these studies. Uh, we were able to move from more fundamental research on the response of the plant to severe stress into some uh, applied scenarios that could work in commercial vineyards. And here I'm going to summarize some of the conclusion of these as well as of other um, you know, of the various studies we perform on this topic. When we apply water deficit, we can we know we reduce the canopy size, and actually we know we reduce the photosynthesis, um, but not um, um, necessarily. Generally, we generally we have a reduction also of um, yield, but not necessarily we have a reduction of fruit quality. Actually, in many cases we have the opposite side: a higher fruit quality that can result in a higher wine quality. Water deficit reduces berry size and yield, but actually not always, because it depends on the severity. Uh, mild to moderate water deficit has small effects on the, on the size and the yield. And we saw actually some examples uh, uh, during the last slides and the timing. So depending when we apply, we have different effects. And so when we apply water deficit or regulated water deficit, during ripening in the last part of the season, we have a smaller effect or a small effect on yield, or actually in some cases, not significant effect on yield and berry size. But regulated deficit irrigation can be applied to reduce water usage in vineyards. Our late deficit treatment allowed to reduce 38% of irrigation water um, without affecting yield. And we learned, we knew kind of from uh, previous studies that we can use this strategy to improve the quality of, um, well, the concentration of anthocyanins and other phenolics in red grapes. But we also learned that we can improve the concentration of terpenes in white grapes. And therefore, regulated deficit irrigation is a tool that we can use to improve grape and wine quality in both white and um, red grape varieties. So I would like to acknowledge uh, all the people that has contributed to this um, research, particularly uh, the research I've been presenting from the Okanagan Valley was performed uh, by the master student Eugene Kovalenko, as well as uh, with the support of uh, different uh, several lab members and uh, Andrew Peller Limited and uh, MRS Vineyard Services that help us in the um, experiment in the commercial vineyard. And I would like also to um, thank all the uh, funding um, agencies like the BC One and Grape Council, MITAX, BC Investment and Culture Foundation and ANSERC. And, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any, any question you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simone. <laughs> um, well, we have actually uh, some questions already uh, in the chat, um, but I might take uh, the advantage to ask the first question. Um, and the question is like, uh, I know, I mean, I know it seems like there's a lot of work to do uh, with these like uh, studies of deficit irrigation in white wine, but I'm wondering, um, is there any concern about the long-term effects of those these deficit irrigation? Because obviously your your project, your yeah. experiment was yeah. short term. Did. What is known about that? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the red wine. Yeah, yeah. this is a very very good question. Important question we we might we have. And we had uh, because we uh, people has seen some long term effects of severe water deficit, for instance, on the yield of the vineyard. And because grapevine is a perennial crop, we want to grow grapes for 20, 30, 50 years in a vineyard. Long term effect might be actually very important to consider. So there are studies that are reporting reduction in yield and fertility of the vineyard with severe water deficit. Um, these reductions are not dramatic, but they are significant. In um, So important to be considered. Um, one 
in our case, actually, in our study, we did uh, analyze every year the fertility of the buds as well as the you know the, the overall fertility of the vineyard and yields, and we did not observe any effect of the our treatment in, uh, on that. And I think the reason is this uh, was a moderate let's say mild moderate water stress if we go to more severe ones yes we do observe those changes okay yeah that makes sense okay so i would like to uh, maybe offer the opportunity to greg stewart to unmute himself if he's around and ask his question if he prefers me to ask the question i can I can ask the question by him. I think that please tell me. Oh, there you go, Greg. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm happy to ask it if you guys can hear me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Simon, very interesting presentation. And I'm not an expert in in vineyards at all. What I was um do develop a, a lot of products which look at tomato crops and try to measure how that how the crops are doing, like measure it live, right? So we do this for things like you know the IPM and the pests and 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 also for the production. So what I'm wondering about in all of this water stress. You've tied it very well to the stress of the plants and the uh, the quality of the, of the grapes and, and the wine at the end, right? Are there commercial techniques that where people are measuring what's going on in the crop? And I'm wondering about even things like to decide that one side of the vineyard needs a little more water than the other one, just because of the slope or the sun or, or whatever you may have, right? So I'm curious about kind of how far along those techniques are. Oh yeah, yeah that's actually a very, important another very important part like the measuring i've i've been uh showing water potential are actually easy well relatively easy to do but time consuming and actually challenged to do to map the whole vineyard they it's possible but yeah. it's labor intensive and so people are developing the uh, obviously different strategies to to manage the irrigation you know, by taking well measurement, continuous measurements like obviously the soil, soil moisture measure measurements or soil water potential. Also, in that case, well, one thing, one one problem is that we will need to have many sensors around the vineyards to map yeah. all this variability. Variability is a very critical aspect, mm -hmm. and maximizing the quality requires also taking that into consideration. So people is working a lot on thermal thermal imaging now and well using drones or other techniques to take images of the of the canopy and relate this the the temperature of the canopy to a given water status um, so there are some limitations still some limitation but i know that there are they've been there are some people or some some um, well some some studies have been success, successful in doing that so that's actually probably kind of um, uh, one of the most most promising okay. um, techniques to have a nice mapping of how our vineyards or, or vineyard is behaving because definitely we can have an area that is under stress and the other area that is uh, well has is receiving too much irrigation. That is actually one of the major issues, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the optimization of the quality from a vineyard. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, great. Actually, I would like to add that I was part of a, uh, of a study where we were exactly doing that using drones and, and remote cameras uh, that were uh, flying on top of uh, some, in my, in my case, it was rice crops uh, where we were applying biochar. So completely different story, but we were checking also the, the water stress. And, and I think drones and remote sensing uh, cameras are becoming like the, the direction for this spatial distribution of, of the efforts of water stress. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Greg, for your question. I, I would like to allow Rob Barnick to unmute himself. And also if you can, if you can mention uh, where are you calling us from or, or a little bit of information about you that might be actually helpful for everyone else to know who you are. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm calling from uh, Vancouver Island on the Sandwich Territories. And I have, what a wonderful presentation and I have so many questions. I will try to restrict myself just to the one topic of CO2. We know that heat and wind and sun are primary in determining how much water a plant wants, but CO2 is a very strong mediator as a, an auxin precursor, and it changes the number of stomata that a leaf will form at high levels. 
have you looked at the effects of CO2 on uh, plant stress and, and water? I know that with a 40 to 50% increase in CO2 levels, plants have uh, developed 40 to 50% more tendency towards sugar and lower tendency mm -hmm. towards those amides and things that are uh, dependent on, on growing with less of their vigor put towards sugars. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, well, uh, it's definitely, my comment is, is, is it is definitely uh, an important uh, thing to study, uh, particularly with the, you know, with, with the climate change. And actually we do have, I think so far, just a couple of studies on the effect of um, CO2 levels on the physiology of the plant and quality of the grapes. They come from um, uh, an experiment, um, well, a group or a research group in Germany, Geisenheim University, and they have this phase. So, uh, well, this phase system to increase CO2 levels in vineyards. Um, they did test increasing CO2 Interestingly, they didn't see many differences as expect as you know, they didn't see as many differences they were expected in their hypothesis in terms, for instance, of sugar level in the fruit. And that was done in Riesling. Um, however, this is definitely something that we need to test more because we know that there will be a change, or there is already a change in the CO2 levels, and 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 the community is getting more interested in, in assessing these changes on the quality as well as the yield. But as I said, so far the, the only study in an op, in an open vineyard or a couple of studies. Uh, did not result in major changes in, in yield and, and quality of the fruit. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for the great questions. I think it's 2.59. Um, so I might invite people to leave uh, if they need to leave. Uh, but Simone, if you don't mind, Solveig has a question. Um, so, like, would you mind to answer her question? And people can stay if they want. It's just yeah, like, I can. I can stay other, you know, five minutes if okay. it's okay with you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so if you want, uh, but everyone else, please let let me just uh, wrap up for everyone who wants to leave, just to be mindful and respectful uh, with their time. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we are gonna pause these seminars for the summer because people deserve a break. And apparently COVID-19 is giving us also a little break for <laughs> take up a break and relax. Uh, but we will come back on, se on September and we will uh, keep, uh, we will continue reaching out to you uh, to promote our seminar. So thank you so much, everyone. And whoever wants to stay for solving a uh, question can stay. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Simone. <laughs> thank you. Solveig, go ahead, you can ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering what you've observed um, with this group of growers in terms of um, adopting practices that researchers like you are are developing. Like, if you, you see that people are adopting them pretty readily, or will they trial them on a piece of their orchard before oh. adopting them further? I think it depends. Um, I, I, you know, some of the irrigation strategies for um, for red grapes have been widely adopted. It, there are kind mm -hmm. of some some uh, different, uh, how to say, like uh, groups of, or uh, like I know that, uh, uh, for instance, in Australia, they are widely adopted. California, they are quite adopted. And therefore, in for instance, in British Columbia, where several uh, growers uh, and a winemaker received the training in those universities, they come back with kind of that background and they, uh, as I've been showing, they use some of the tools I've been showing here to manage irrigation. So they, in, uh, they are quite uh, well adopted, adopted the strategies for white grapes. I think it's gonna be slow, but there are definitely, we are in contact with two wineries that they, they did it and they, are, they were excited. So um, I'm, yeah, it probably will take more time for white grapes because we have to, to, to be learn more. We have just few studies that are showing some effects. So there are many other things to consider, but definitely there are the, the, the industry is open to these 
strategies because they again the sustainability component is important for our industry uh, as well as there is a strong attention on the quality rather than the yield so that's why they 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 are not too scared about the the yield component they are more scared actually if something else in the quality we are not considering by any chance my result in not being so good yeah great thank you well, Simone, there is a final question from Andrew uh, Black, um, and it seems a good one and a pertinent one. Oh you... my God, no, it's going to be difficult to answer. No, I don't think so. Andy, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was just wondering um, uh, regarding uh, water conservation. Uh, what percentage of vineyard water use is, is due to the grass intero? Is is that a common practice? And and what is the value uh, of the grass intero? Is carbon yeah. sequestration one of the one of the issues here? Just wondering. Yeah. So I cannot answer to the the percentage. I think we have the estimate, but we I I now I don't I don't remember. There are you know we always work in our case we always work with grass intervals it's quite common but i know you can also tillage and get rid of it so there are definitely several studies that are assessing how these grass intervals are generally affecting the you know the water balance of the vineyard uh, i cannot give you the percentage of that contribution um that's uh the in terms of though the the value of that grass interval there are several values and and i must say that uh yeah most of the vineyards i see that do have the grass interval is uh, the tillage is not so common anymore there are values in terms of the soil health the fact of the compactedness of the soil in some maybe not so much in dry areas but definitely in several regions, you know, we have to use tractors, we have to spray, we have to go through those rows many times and having the grass interval helps maintaining the structure of the soil uh, and avoid, you know, too much compact, uh, compact soils. Um, you know, there, there are, well, di different positive effects of the grass interval in a vineyard that I feel that uh, most of the growers now are, are, are seeding uh, different, you know, di different species for the different, you know, advantages, particularly now also on the uh, fix uh, fixation of nitrogen. And, and um, a lot of the vineyards are moving into organic uh, farming in, in uh, you know, organic farming is becoming very, very popular uh, in, in the, um, uh, grape and wine industry uh, and is probably the percentage is one of the highest in the world now that we will have in few years in British Columbia. So, you know, maintaining or managing the soil fertility and soil structure with the grass inter interval is become, you know, is of increasingly importance. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you. Thanks very much. Enjoy the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think I think we can finally release you, Simone. <laughs> uh, it has been really great. I actually uh, enjoyed this seminar particularly because I understood every single thing you said, <laughs> which is not always the case. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you so much. I really think like this seems like there's a lot of uh, opportunity to study greenhouse gases uh, with these like water uh, deficit irrigations. Um, so Andy and, and Simone, I encourage you to follow up. Um, yeah. And again, I would like to thank you everyone uh, for being here today. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did and see you in September, basically. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for hosting the seminar. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Bye. Uh, bye, bye. See you again. Bye. 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 bye.